suppose you're a high school teacher and you're teaching the kids about electromagnetic forces and about high voltage and a Tesla coil is something that's really going to get their attention. Something like this, you probably are not going to build in your garage. Uh, we're going to show you how this one works and then show you a simpler one that you could put together to use in your classroom. This one starts off with a neon sign transformer. You can plug them into the wall, turns 120 volts into 15,000 volts. That electricity comes up to these copper coils up here. It's just a spiral that goes out of copper coils. And it doesn't uh, just sit there like a constant current. It's going bang, 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 bang. 120 bangs per second. And those bangs create an electromagnetic field that rushes upwards like this. And these fine turns of wire have all those electrons just sitting there minding their own business. The electric, electromagnetic field comes up and pushes those electrons to the top. And they got to go somewhere. So they jump off from the top. It, in order to get the good strong bangs, there's a whole bunch of capacitors here that will store the energy from that neon sign transformer. And then back in the back, there are some copper tubes with a tiny space between all the copper tubes. And every time the arc goes through all those tubes, it stores and releases the energy from these capacitors to make the bang, bang, bang. Something like this is really noisy. It generates a lot of ultraviolet light where those tubes are. It makes a lot of ozone. And it's pretty close to lethal. It's 900 watts. So you, you really don't want the spark to hit you. It would be a bad thing. Uh, and it's super heavy. It's hard to move around in your classroom. Now, there is an alternative, however. You can take the same principle and build a smaller one if you don't have space, you don't have time to build one of those huge ones, here's a small one. You can put it on a shelf anywhere. Uh, you buy all the parts from one Tesla online. You can buy them already built or you can buy them as a kit. I think it was about $400 for all the stuff that's inside. But it didn't work all that great when I first got it. There were some problems but we'll talk about those later. I want to show you what this one does because it does something unusual. It has a, all of the electronic components that make this work are inside that little box. And it changes the voltage we give it, 120 volts here, into, I don't know, maybe around 100,000 volts up there and shoots it off of this wire. And I'm going to turn it on and show you what it does. The best part of this is that you can get different notes to come out of it. And you can go low notes. And you can change the power. If you that's maximum power, then we'll turn it down so you can see what it does. This thing we can build from a kit and make it do 
fun stuff. It will play two notes at a time. When you buy the kit, they give you this box. And this box has an on off switch and a MIDI fix switch and a power switch and a frequency switch. Um, when it's on fixed, then these guys let you do some things without the keyboard, which is pretty handy. Let's just turn this on. It's in the fixed mode. We'll give it some power. And as long as this is on, the Tesla coil, you can hear it in the background, it's making a spark. If we turn up the power, we can make it be either a big spark or a small spark. Now I'm going to turn it on again. This time I'm going to turn the power to about medium, and then I'm going to change the frequency knob. So here it's on. So from the point of view of a classroom demonstration, this is fantastic. You can make sparks, you can make them big, you can make them small, and you can change the frequency of these sparks. Now, if you happen to have a keyboard, it can be an old one because it uses these old style five pin MIDI cables. And you can plug that right into this box. Now, if you put it on MIDI and turn the power on, nothing happens. But if you poke the keyboard, you can have your Tesla coil play for you. Kids love this. So you've got something you can demonstrate with. Now, here at Rocket Science, we like to go a little bit further. I'm going to turn this off. You don't want to get close to the coil with any chance of it turning on while you're there. This Variac makes sure that there's no power available for the coil itself. This switch turns the Variac off. In order to make it run, the Variac has to be all the way on, has to be turned to full power, and this has to be on all at the same time in order to get zapped. We use a Variac to make sure that none of the noise, electrical noise, gets through the power lines and into the building. If you've got neighbors in other classrooms, you don't want their computers to go nutty because you're doing something weird in your classroom. So a Variac like this creates a separation between your stuff and their stuff. When you buy the coil, they give you this brass wire and you fasten it to the top and the arc comes off the wire. If you take the wire off, you don't get any arc. There's not enough power here to make arcs come spontaneously off this smooth surface. Electrons love to jump off of sharp points. We're going to take that off and put on a gizmo. Gizmos are fun to play with. And I happen to have some junk. I have tons of junk. Which is a little tiny gear motor and a spare gear, battery, and a switch. So when I turn that on, these guys rotate. And you wonder, what's going to happen if I put this on top of a Tesla coil? When you put all that energy, is it going to make the battery explode? Is it going to burn up my motor? What is it going to do if the arcs do get up onto the wires? These are all good questions. Of course, we have to find out. So it's just sitting there. 
this black ring is aluminum, so power can come up that. You can go through the casing of the motor to the gears, and it can go up these metal rods into those wires. Or it could go through the battery. You never know. And we want to see what's going to happen. So we're going to turn out the lights, turn this on, and see what it does. So, battery didn't blow up, so sad. These guys went around, and there was lots of very small little blue arcs along the wires. And you may have noticed that when I was playing a high pitch, when these guys crossed each other, it did something weird. But when I played the low note, it wasn't noticeable. Now, we can take these guys off. And... substitute something else. What if we just put some plain old wires on here? Let's see if this is the right positioning for them. Now they're going to touch each other right there. And they just miss each other on this side. We want to see if anything weird's going to happen when they touch each other. So here you have something pretty simple. If you have a whole bunch of different wire shapes you want to try out, you don't have to worry about them touching each other or anything else that can go on. Because as the arcs come up, the voltage is, is the same just about everywhere. And it can jump off and you don't have to worry about them exploding or doing anything bizarre, or welding themselves together just because they happen to touch each other. Let's stop this. Like that. What you do have to worry about is this generates a lot of ozone. And along with ozone, it's making a bunch of nitrogen oxides. So you want to have your classroom, you want some ventilation in your classroom so that you can get that out of there. If you smell a strong odor from the ozone, that means there's too much. You don't want to be exposed to that for eight hours a day. Uh, you want to have fresh air always coming by. Now, we're going to go into some of the problems with making one of these. If you build it the way the kit is instructions tell you, 
with all the pieces that they tell you and with typical you know teacher type soldering chances are you're going to blow out a whole bunch of components and it's not going to work very well so we're going to turn it completely off and show you some of the pieces and give you some uh, some hints about ways to make it work a little bit better okay there's there's three cords that plug into it uh, this main one here provides the current necessary to run the primary coil. It's 120 volts. The second one is 19 volts, like computer power supply, that runs the electronics inside. The third one is an optical fiber that runs from your control box. So you're not anywhere near any voltage when you're running this. You're just near some light that's blinking on and off real fast and everything goes into this plastic box they give you. There it is. When you build it, that's the circuit you have to assemble. It comes blank. You have to sort out all the components, read the tiny little resistors, and put them through the holes and solder everything in place. You can tell there's quite a bit of stuff in there. And if you make one mistake, it won't work. And all the soldering has to be done so the solder flows really well. And let's turn it over and see if you can see any of the bottom. Oh yeah, perfect. So each one of these components comes through those tiny little holes. And you got to solder it. And the solder has to flow in and around the wire perfectly. Now my eyes aren't all that good. So I did all the soldering under a 40 power lens microscope and made sure that every one was done right. I read all the resistors under the microscope so that when I was done, I turned it on and it worked first time. If you make a mistake, uh, you're going to blow out a whole bunch of stuff and you're not going to know what you blew out. So it really pays off to do that meticulously. And these fat traces here, okay, the fat traces have a bunch of solder melted onto it so it can carry the huge amount of current that goes through there. The current that goes through these ends up going into this primary coil right here, these black wires that are wrapped around. It's only about 300 volts and it should never be able to jump through that insulation, but it does. It arcs right to here. And that's dangerous because these carry a lot more current than this does. If you're being foolish and are holding a fluorescent bulb or something near the Tesla coil and this arcs over to here, what you're doing is allowing that extra current to go through you. That's a bad thing. So I insulated this by putting this plastic bowl, it's just a big bowl that I had, cut a hole in the bottom of it and slid it down over the coil and I glued it in place right to the cylinder that they give you in the kit. And then I filled all the gaps with ordinary paraffin. Just melted it and poured it in there. And paraffin worked great. Uh, I poured it on the outside of the coil, I poured it on the inside of the coil, filled up every gap. No air gaps around it. And now there's no arcing between the primary and the secondary and that way it's a whole lot safer than before plus it protects your circuits. When they give you the kit they have this coil mounted right on top. See that hole there? That's their mounting hole for the secondary. Well it's sitting right on top of a heat sink that controls two of the main components. Behind that colorful coil, right behind that red, white, and blue coil there is a couple of three prong thingamajiggies that turn the voltage on and off really, really fast. And they get hot. And this heat sink helps cool them off. Well, if you have something like this right on top of that, you can get inductive heating. And you're heating up the very thing that you want to have kept cool. Plus, you're going to get all kinds of stray electromagnetic fields wandering around down in there blowing stuff out. So I made this box out of some perforated aluminum, just bent the corners 
just bent these corners in a vise and grounded it. And this prevents any garbage from the coil from getting into these circuits, at least enough, so we don't blow anything out. It's well worth the trouble to make a box like this so that these things don't blow out. I haven't had any components in there blow out, and we really use this a lot. The box has a couple of stops. I just put some pieces of plastic in there so that when you slide in the main components, it stops there. And these are the wires that connect to the inside of the box. That It would be nicer to put a high voltage connector on there if you have one. So, and up here, I'll stick my finger through, that's the access hole for the screwdriver. And if you can focus right through that hole, those are the screws that go to the primary coil. And that lets you get in there to connect or disconnect this if you need to work on anything inside. I modified the box. I put an extra hole in the top so I can reach in there with a screwdriver because this wire uh, runs the 300 volts up to the primary and the screws are in the box. It's really hard to get to them any other way. You have to kind of like fish around down in there. Oh, there they are. And give it a little twist get them free. There's probably some connector you could buy that would do this a whole lot easier, but it came with screws. Okay. In order to make things work a little bit easier, I mounted it all to a board, and this keeps the coil uh, really sturdy, and since it's already mounted in paraffin, it's strong that way. It gives me a place to fasten my grounding box, and you can see that on the back side, I ran the wire from the secondary through the box itself and off to a ground uh, at one of the copper pipes that goes into the building here. So that way we have a good ground, we have a sturdy thing that we can pick up and move around. I put some cloth tape on the bottom just so that it slides around easily. When you first start putting the kit together, you notice they, they give you a cable that goes from your control box over to whatever you're using as a keyboard, and the third connection goes to a laptop. And the laptop has some software that runs the keyboard. In this case, it was this, this white keyboard. And when I first plugged it in and ran it, it worked great. And I was playing music and having a great time. And then next day I came back, wouldn't work at all. And I thought, what's wrong? What did I do? Did I you know, mess up with the software? And I, I spent over a week screwing around with software, trying to figure out what the problem was. And I found out after a long time that the problem was right there inside of this bit of cable. I didn't know it was there until I bought a cheap MIDI cable that doesn't connect to a laptop and just goes straight from your control box over to your keyboard. And it worked perfect. And I thought, oh man, I spent all that time trying to figure out what was wrong with the software when it, the problem was here in this thing. So. You know, if, if you run into problems like that, throw that out and just get a straight through 5-pin MIDI cable and you'll be all set to go.